Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Hello and welcome to the show. Thank you for joining today. My guest is Chris Lento. He's the founder of EM Capital Group, a former aerospace engineer in Boston. And uh, like a lot of us has a, you know, got the real estate bug, started doing his own deals. Uh, in his case, these these three-story uh, houses that are very common in Boston where you've got different tenants, a different tenant basically living on each floor, very common up there. Uh, he got into that, had success with that, started expanding that, and then started expanding to other markets and uh, growing the type of assets or the size of assets he's getting into. And then uh, bringing on outside capital too, which is kind of for a lot of operators, the ultimate accelerant when you're bringing on outside capital lets you go do bigger deals. So great story. Uh, Chris is a really sharp guy. Uh, we talk about how he built the business, how he's running things, how they're looking at deals, current market conditions. Uh, just a sharp guy and, and enjoyed getting to uh, to know a fellow real estate entrepreneur. So I hope you enjoy it as well. Let's get into the episode with Chris. This episode is brought to you by DJE Texas Management Group, a San Antonio, Texas-based real estate investment firm with a track record of transacting on several hundred million dollars of multifamily land and industrial deals throughout Texas. DJE has been in business for over a decade and is approaching 100 team members in San Antonio. To learn more about DJE, visit djetexas.com or the link in the show notes of this episode. This episode is also brought to you by apartmenteducators.com, a complete ecosystem for professionals to learn how to find, finance, and operate large multifamily properties for profit. You can get started with a free mini course and learn more at apartmenteducators.com or visit the link in the notes. Chris, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. I appreciate you jumping on today. Looking forward to diving into some uh, some shop talk here on the on the real estate front. But uh, before we do that, how about some background on you, some some info for the listeners? And always love to hear your story about where you started out and how you got into uh, how you got into investing. Yeah, of course. Um, so I uh, started at, in my career as a systems engineer in the aerospace industry. So I worked for a defense contractor here in the Boston area for 15 years doing um, big Navy contracts. And uh, in parallel, I was investing in these these three-deckers or three-family apartment complexes here in Boston. They're yeah. kind of everywhere. Yeah. So kind of viewed it as a, a side hustle or you know something good to have when I retire. Yep. And I just really liked it. I liked it more than my regular job. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and I didn't see it as scalable. So as I sort of grew in my career and I was in DC for a couple of years and I saw sort of the procurement side of our, of uh, all these defense contracts. Um, I started thinking, well, how do I switch over? Because I can see this whole industry and it's just massive. And I'm sort of a classic engineer. I like to get things done, make progress. And right. these projects were just enormous and they were very political. And I, I was just kind of sick of it. Yeah. Um, started scaling my stuff to larger apartment complexes, bringing in outside investors. Um, and then I kind of, it kind of clicked. All right, this could be a career, not just a sort of a side investment activity. So six years ago, um, you know, things, things were financially in a good spot. So I left my company and started my own, my own uh, company. And then, yeah, it's been going, going, you know, really well since then, strong growth and, uh, you know, learning a ton, uh, you know, constantly. Yeah. yeah. What were some of those first projects that you were in, uh, those real estate investments that you're doing while you're also having the W2? Was that, was it smaller projects or were you like a limited partner on somebody else's bigger deal? What did those look like? No, they're smaller projects. So like I said, Boston has a lot of these three families. So there's three apartments stacked on top of each other. In one, um, in one house, right? In one, it's like a vertical flat roof or sometimes pitch roof, three unit. So they would be yep. like a two bedroom, one bath, two bedroom, one bath, two bedroom, one bath, all stacked. It's like yep. a really common product up here in Boston. Yep. There's some in Philadelphia too. Um, My brother, kind of lived north, Northeast. Yeah, we'd visit him and he'd be, he'd have the second story, you know, him and a couple yep. roommates. Yeah, yeah, it's very common. So I, I bought one of those um, in East Boston, which is kind of the airport neighborhood. And yep. it was a little bit, 
kind of off the beaten path at the time. And I lived in one and, you know, as the others became vacant, I either moved into it or I fixed up, fix it up, you know, on a turn. Um, you know, did that for maybe a year or two, took the equity, got a, you know, a HELOC, bought one down the street, did yeah. the same thing. Um, and then rolled into a five unit, probably about a million dollar building, um, about 45 minutes from Boston. Right. And this was when I was starting to think, all right, you know, Boston's expensive and the cash flow is tough. You're so, right. you know, where else is there a better, at the time I was thinking like rent to price ratio, you know, sure. not it, it just very simplistically. Um, good and, metric, right. Shoot from yeah, the hip. Good metric. Right. Yep. Exactly. And then, you know, I was starting to think about the Southeast and you know, not uh, a Boston market. So I bought a property in Salem, Mass, which is 45 minutes away. And I got, this is the first time I hired a full-time property manager to run it. I was running the day-to-day before. Yep. And I was, in my head, I was like, all right, this place is in Florida. Like you're going to visit it yeah. every six months. Can't go there. Trust, you, right. Yep. You can't fix a toilet. You can't go up there to solve some sort of problem. And so I visited, you know, probably every three months. Yeah. Um, but I treated it truly like it was, you know, uh, um, not it, not accessible. Sure. And it worked out really well. I like I enjoyed the freedom that that gave me. Yeah. I learned how to manage the property manager, um, and then that gave me the confidence to ten thirty one exchange that property into a twenty four unit in Florida, actually Excellent. Tallahassee. So yeah, so you you actually went Florida on that next one. I did. Yeah, <laughs> practicing it. Yeah, which uh-huh. was just a coincidence. So. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Um, it's interesting investing remotely. You know, we we've kind of taken the opposite approach and invested pretty much in San Antonio and and surrounding areas. But one of the things I think about is just kind of deal flow, right? If you're searching nationally and, and you're you know kind of a startup private equity, how do you manage? How do you manage deal flow? How how do you get the Florida deal right? Did you look at a thousand deals in in twenty states, or were you pretty set on that one market? What, what did that look like? Yeah, I mean, maybe if you have a big shop, you can you can look nationally, but right. you, it's impossible, right? Like impossible, you can't yeah. know the the national market, um, and and, and, de- and develop those broker relationships. So I kind of picked markets, right? So um, I had targeted Tallahassee as a potential up and coming market, and at the time I had targeted Jacksonville. They're about two hour drive. So I focused on those two markets, um, you know, found out who the major brokers were in those markets, established a relationship with, with them, you know, try to get on the phone with them every every couple of weeks, get on their email lists, get their deal flow, you know, start the relationship so I could, so I could get those shortlist deals that, you know, didn't make it to the email blast. Um, and, and that's how I've really kind of developed my portfolio since then. So, so targeting, markets of interest uh with you know periodic reevaluation like is this market sort of past its peak or isn't what i thought it was, was going to be or is there another you know with the um inflation reduction act there's a lot of huge uh infrastructure projects going on around right. the country so, yeah right. so it, you know got me thinking well where are these going to impact and what's what is the ramifications of these you know ten thousand jobs going to be um on housing you know, in the next five years yep so there's pros and cons. I mean, um, I think if I had been in Texas, I might have a different approach because, sure. you know, the market's different, but being in the Northeast, um, that was my approach. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, niche down on one market, you know, it takes a lot of time to build those relationships. I, you know, I want to run something by you that I, I talk to a lot of kind of newer operators or aspiring operators and Managing deal flow is a challenge. Um, you picked, you know, one market specifically that solves a lot of the problems. But what's your feedback for people on, let's say, you are building a, a new broker relationship in a new market? You want to get feedback to them. I mean, they they want quick feedback. Did you develop any oh, yeah. systems or processes to say, hey, you know, uh, John Smith in Tallahassee is a broker I want to build a relationship with? What's the process to kind of make sure you're looking at deals? Um, and, and, and getting feedback in a timely manner to where they're, Hey, they're going to start taking your calls. Right. Uh, so, you know, first would be, you know, figure out who's doing, you know, the, the majority of the deals. So we got yep. John Smith, um, check out, you know, get on his email list. So go to their website, sign up as an interested investor, you know, check, check all the boxes about asset class that you like size, whatever their, 
kind of interface has. So now you're getting their emails. Um, pretty much the first email you get, or even grab one off their website and just call them and kind of introduce yourself, but ask them about the deal. Uh, you know, brokers like cold calls, but they don't, they want to talk about the deal. And sure. um, so, so pick one that you're mildly interested in and use it as a, a test case. And just kind of introduce yourself, talk about it, establish that relationship. Um, once you have that person, you know, in your system, I use monday.com to track mm -hmm. my deals. I've set up sort of like a, like a 12 step pipeline process and you know they come in and um you know so now all my emails come in i have an executive assistant who screens them for state size yep. um asset class vintage um if they don't pass um there's an automatic email response that goes back to the broker and says hey i'm not interested here's why if it's from left field like if it's a utah um shop that i never really expressed interest I'll just unsubscribe to that. Um, right. And then there's three stages through my early pipeline process where um, if I if they move to the next one, there's kind of a canned email that goes out that says, hey, John Smith, you know, we were taking a deep dive into the underwriting on this one. We like it because, and I can put in some, you know, specifics to that deal that, that key off of that. And I, I put that in place probably about four months ago. And right. it's been very well received i think the brokers know it's canned but they're like at least i know something's happening you know Absolutely. it's not just sending it into the ether yeah nothing's worse than just being ghosted for for a broker right. or anybody so at least you're getting something yeah and then if they go into the like you know pass bucket um there's also a similar you know email that says you know we're going to pass on this one because and i can type into the system you know what the reason is i don't like the location crime's too high what have you but you know keep them coming and then yeah. they'll get that. So they sort of can cross me off their list. And a lot of those emails will spur calls. They'll call and be like, wait a minute. No, you got the location all wrong. You know? Yeah, good. Yeah, that's yeah, valuable. Yeah, exactly. That's valuable feedback. Yeah. I love it. There's a real peace of mind too that comes with kind of systematizing and and automating those things where you kind of know where your deals are in the pipeline. And, you know, we can set up kind of a similar thing for so many of our business processes where I just look at my tasks due this week and if it's not on there, I'm not, I'm not thinking about it, you know, right. cause I know that when there's any number of things, a loan maturity or, you know, any, any one of a thousand business tasks that I need to um, have on my radar, it's going to pop up at the, at the right time. And the system um, is going to handle that. And it just creates like all this offloading of these mental cycles that you can put in the CRM or whatever the system is. And that just, uh, as makes work more enjoyable for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that stuff kind of weighs on your kind of, your background mental yeah, processes. It's taking cycles, which is it's not a it's not doing anything, but it's still taking mental cycles. Yeah. It's like, I just get this out of my out of my um sh you know, the, the short term memory, just pull it out of right. there. Focus yeah, on no, it. absolutely. Yeah. And especially with deal flow, you know, like if a broker right. calls you, if your relationship with a dozen brokers, it's nice to be able to, you know, click their name in your system and you pull up the deals they're associated with and you can get to it fast. Yeah. Um so yeah, there's a, there's a huge value to having kind of processes in place. For sure. Uh, deal merge gets thrown around a lot, you know, from every broker <laughs> yeah. and lender we talked to. I, I got an email today on a deal we have on a contract. We're trying to, you know, close it. And they're like, hey, we need these three things, these three pieces of information. I was like, I, this is not making sense. Is this on this property? And they were like, oh, that's one of our other deals. Sorry. I was like, there you go. Right. Yeah. Like, happens, yeah. happens to everybody. Happens to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's good. That's that's good feedback, and I think that's you know super important to start to build out your system so that you are, you know, only using those CPU cycles in the brain for for those more important things. I want to get a sense for you. You know, you did some of these deals on your own. That's how I started. That's how lots of other people have started, kind of starting with their own capital, maybe in their backyard, and then seeing some potential, and then growing that over time. What was the process like for you going from, hey, this is, you know, kind of a test case, it's my money, it's my deal to actually bringing on investor capital. How, how did you make that switch? That's a big, that's a big turning point, I think, for a lot of us. Yeah. Um, so when I, when I did that 1031 exchange into the Florida property, I, I viewed that as a test case. Yeah. Um, it was a, a bigger property. It truly was out of state. I, I had been I think dramatically improving my understanding of real estate at the time and was now underwriting it like, like you underwrite and not 
like I was before, which was like very cash flow based and very amateur and looking back. Yeah. Um, and I said, all right, let me make this big transition, buy this bigger property out of state, and I'm going to treat it like it has investors. Nice. I apologize. It's happening good? here. So I used, so I used that Florida deal as a test case, um, and I, you know, underwrote it with investor metrics and general partner metrics, and looked at it, you know, like it was a, a GPLT deal. Um, and then once I got about six months under my belt on that, um, I, in parallel, I would started been ramping up my marketing and talking to friends and family and um, friends of friends about, you know, that I was going to start doing this basically career change. Sure. So. Um, so that gave me the confidence um, and I got a good feedback. You know, I was surprised with how many people are unaware that you can make kind of private placement investments Absolutely. out there Correct. and how excited they were about it. Right. You know, um, Everyone wants to do it and they don't know the on-ramp. It's like every adult that has kind of some modicum of financial wherewithal wants to do it and they don't know how. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was, you know, very confidence uh, building that right. there was this demand out there. Um, and yeah, that that just basically gave me the gave me the confidence I needed to to make the jump and start sort of marketing the first deal that I, I got. And I, the first deal that I actually marketed was a partner deal. So someone right. that I had, you know, association with right. kind of got late stages in a closing and needed capital. Sure. And they knew that I was starving. So we partnered together yep. um, on a deal, you know, after I vetted it, obviously. Um, and that was yeah my first raise. It wasn't huge. It was going to be like six hundred thousand. Yeah, it's um, good that I had to bring. But yeah, yeah, especially especially starting out, and that's a very common structure. One we kind of talk a lot about with operators, and, and that was even my first kind of not quite solo, but my first multifamily that I was like the primary lead sponsor on after doing a couple smaller deals with other more experienced partners was one hundred thirty units where Hayes me running this deal, but I actually had a friend in Boston that came in and he raised uh, a little less than half the money and helped uh, with the the loan guarantor situation to kind of get net worth and liquidity across the line. And, um, and, you know, it was a great partnership, just kind of a one-off, one-off deal where half the, half the investors were in Texas with us. The other half were in Boston and my partner was in Boston, but it's, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have, neither of us would have got the deal without the other. It worked right. out great, you know, and, and what's cool about those partnerships is they can build your career, but you're not, you know, my, my private equity company, I don't have a partner. It's just me. Right. I, yeah. I and all the other companies I have for the most part, they're my companies. I don't have long-term partnerships for the, for the operating companies, but, but deal by deal. Yeah. Let's, let's do a partnership that maybe lasts three, four years and, um, has a very specific outcome and then, and then you get out if it makes sense to do it again. Great. But uh, you, you don't have to, and that's, it just creates a lot of flexibility to get these deals done. Yeah. And I found the same thing. Like I would say, you know, that discovering the out of state sort of larger model, you know, making the recognition that outside capital was, was, you know, a, a huge growth opportunity and then finding kind of strategic partners. Like you said, yep. um, I don't have any partners in my core business either. Sure. But on many of my deals, I partner with other syndicators doing very similar things that I'm doing because yep. we can handle, you know, bigger properties that are higher quality, um, right. better property management. Um, and it takes, you know, you can create a team environment, but it's not permanent, which which is nice. Yeah, that's right. And these deals, one of the things I like about these larger deals is. The pie is just bigger. I mean, you know, you go you I've done a bunch of these, but you partner with somebody to flip a house and there's you know, 20 K of net profit after it's all said and done. And then you pay taxes and cut it in half. And it's like, that's just yep. not very exciting. It's not um, worth the time. Yeah. You 10 or $20 million deal. Like, okay. You know, we're talking about some, some, some bigger numbers here where there's people that are professional and make a very strong, you know, W2 earning can, it can be compelling for those kind of people. So yep. that, that's a nice, yep. nice component of doing the bigger deals. Yeah. And I like on the bigger deals that, that, most of the people you work with are, are of higher caliber. I was right? just like going to say that. Yeah. I mean, like the whole cast of characters, I don't know how much your, you know, your experience on the the three story stuff was, but I, I've done a, 
way too many single family projects in my life. And uh, the cast of characters from wholesalers to agents to sellers, right. everybody's completely unsophisticated. And in the, in the larger deal or in the commercial multifamily world, like you're talking about quality players. I mean, from the broker oh, yeah. attorneys to, to sellers, everybody's like relatively sophisticated. It's a breath of fresh air for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not just sophisticated, but they're going to be there for a while. Right. right. Like I feel like in the smaller stuff, like that broker may not even be a broker in a year. Right. Like yeah. that, that GC is may not be in business in the year. Cause they're sort of, why are they taking my, you know, 20 K job? If right. They're a, like a high end general contractor or sure. um, so they're going to either be playing with bigger fish in a year or they'll be doing something else. Cause it didn't suit them. And, you know, when you get into the 20 million plus, or even lower than that, apartment complexes. You know, your PMs have a company. They manage tens of thousands of units. Um, they have structures in place. They have, you know, if someone quits, they have backfill capabilities. Yeah. Um, Much so, so more nice. business. stability. Yeah, yeah. stability, uh, established businesses, uh, uh, those kinds of things makes it, makes it really nice. How's your experience been, um, kind of your perspective now, having done this for a number of years, that kind of owner versus the employee role that you, that you had before. I, I've, I've been in both and they're different worlds, but what's that experience been like for you? Meaning like business owner versus being personally a W2 employee. Yeah. Like, you know, coming from your career uh, as a W2 employee to now being a business owner, obviously very, very different life in so many ways, but what has that transition been like for you? Um. It's been it's been interesting. I, I think I was well aware that it was going to be a transition because I was at the same company, which was like a quasi. It was a defense company, very stable. Sure, you know? sure. Um, like I, I didn't even really pay much attention to the to the Great Recession. You know, right. it wasn't. It was like, well, okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> like I, I read the news, but beyond that, I was unconcerned. Yeah. Um, so, so the, just the general stability changed quite a bit. Um, and I was aware of that. I sort of put some processes in place about, you know, moving money automatically into my checking account. So it kind of seemed like I had a paycheck kind of thing. And, yep. uh, but a lot of that stuff, you know, once you get used to working for yourself and having sort of, um, variable income that, you know, kind of got over that pretty fast. And right. then as far as just, just the sheer amount of functions that you have to have as a small right. business owner. Is, yeah. I, I thought it was great, honestly. I feel like I was just constantly learning about new, new ways the world works that right. I just took for granted in the past. Um, and you know, there's frustrations like who likes to be their own IT department, right? Right. But um, yeah, but overall, it's been it's been great. It's been, I think, way more productive than I was in my kind of regular job because I could see the big picture and I knew that there was, you know, growth potential and and that that growth potential was, you know very high. You know, it wasn't like 4% raise growth. It was, you know, maybe we'll double next year kind of growth. Right. Yeah. It's very exciting and very motivating. And, and, and that really resonates with me. It's been my experience as well. And, and something you said earlier about, especially the environment you were in, you know, huge projects, big bureaucracy. It's frustrating. I, th I think it's a frustrating environment for achievers where it's like, Hey, you know, you just kind of got to sit tight on this thing and you're not really it's, right. it's, it's, this thing's moving is so big and slow moving versus you obviously went to the other end of the spectrum, but you can have immediate impact on things, you know, yes. you can decide something and take action on it immediately. And I think for people that are wired to be high RPM, that's, that's pretty satisfying um, environment to be in. I, you know, I know it is for me to just say like, Hey, my actions are going to be impactful. And then as an equity owner, they can be really impactful. And there's a very direct correlation that that was one of my frustrations in the corporate world. I just didn't feel like my efforts had a, the correlation that I, that I wanted them to. Um, right. So, yeah. And it, you know, that's kind of by design, right? Like you're that's not right. a, yeah. you're not a part owner. You're filling a function that has sure. a, a market value. Sure. So, and, and in you know, sales. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, looking back, it's like, uh, it's, there's some, there's some comfort in that too. There's a lot of worries that you don't, you know, aren't, aren't yours yeah. come in and, and do your job. But uh, at the end of the day, I think, you know, a lot for a lot of us, it's just the best path for 
um, kind of personal growth is, is having a company or having companies. Cause it's, it's a constant, it's a constant, uh, growth mechanism. What I've, it has been my experience, right? Yeah. And I think you also get exposed to a, a different perspective in the people you interact with as well. Certainly. Certainly. You know, uh, entrepreneurs have a different take on things. Yep. There's not a lot of sort of complaining about obstacles. There's a lot of excitement about solutions. Right. Um, so there's a general kind of enthusiasm in, in that group group of people which is which is nice you know it's nice to be around it's energizing it is it's energizing and uh yeah it's it's inherently a bunch of problem solvers so that is exciting to be around and can be frustrating to be around if you're if you are that and then you're in a corporate environment that is you know 99 percent not that i remember my last corporate job i would go to lunch by myself and just throw in a real estate podcast because i can't be around you guys and you're gonna you're going to be complaining about work for an hour at lunch with zero plan to change anything. You know, you've right. been in this apartment for 20 years. Uh, I, can't, I just can't do it. I can't, I can't yeah. be around, right. Um, so there's, there's certainly an element of, uh, of that. Um, so what are you guys, uh, we're talking late 2023 right now. Um, what are you guys seeing on, on deals? Are you looking at assuming, uh, existing debt with a little lower rate, maybe lower leverage. Are you looking at putting new agency debt on stuff? How, how is kind of the current, you know, macro economic, whatever we're in right now, um, yeah, yeah. what you guys are looking at? Yeah. So it's definitely a strange time. Um, yeah. I don't think anybody really knows. Everyone seems to be waiting for something. Yep. Yep. And no one knows what, what they're waiting for. As far as the deals, it's been an interesting quarter we've been best and final on four deals yeah um lost on price a couple of them came back to us yeah um Same. but you know treasury the, the five and ten year have been moving oh, sort yeah. of dramatically yeah which has everyone you know destabilized even more yep uh so you know when it came back to us we said well that that was that was two months ago's price the price is lower now yeah. um and so that didn't go over too well. So, uh, um, but to answer your question more directly, we're looking at everything. You know, a lot of the deals that are penciling are assume assumable debt. Um, yep. it's, you know, it's either a lower rate that you can get now, um, or it's maybe a floater that you have to buy a cap on, but yep. it's got a higher leverage than you could get now. Right. right. Um, which, you know, there's some, I think, risk associated with that, uh, yeah. you know, from, from a, um, like a long-term execution perspective, you know, how long is that floater for? Right. So, so we're sort of looking at, at a longer term debt. Uh, you know, if it is a floater, we're not obviously going to assume like a bridge loan or something right. that's expiring in two years. Um, sure. Be- sure. Because there's so much uncertainty, but we're looking at, you know, all, all options and um, the sentiment out there is, is mixed. I mean, you'll find an occasional optimistic, broker that thinks, you know, Q1 is going to be great, but I feel like everyone's sort of just waiting for, I think the Fed to stabilize or the 10 year to be consistent for a month and a half or so. Right. You know, I was talking to um, someone in my office, when you're looking at the the 10 year treasury every day, multiple times a day, something's not right. That's not right. Yeah. It shouldn't That's move not right. Yeah. No. I mean, you should be looking at it like once a week or something like that. Yep. Um, so that just has to stabilize, I think. You know, so everyone can calm down and say, all right, this is, you know, sort of where we're standing and th- this is how we can execute our business plan based on somewhat firm footing. Yeah, hundred percent. There's, it's not so much the, the numbers, what rates are, what the 10 years at, but the, the, the velocity of the change is, is just, exactly. if, if interest rates are going to be X, all right, we could start to build a plan around that. Mm-hmm. But if, the, if the, you know the floor is just moving on us all the time. It's really hard for, for anybody to kind of get any stability. You, you know, we're hopefully further into this thing or, you know, closer to the end than the beginning. It's been a while now. It's pretty, pretty ab- abrupt uh, set of rate hikes there that have, mm-hmm. have changed everything. But um, yeah, I think we're all kind of hopeful for next year. See what, see what happens with the fed election year and hopefully get some kind of stability, you know, but um, right. it seems like right. there are a lot of these assumable, um, debt deals still out there. If you can make the leverage pencil and 
if a bunch of those transact and and then that dries up, you know, that'll be another set of issues. But um, seems like there's stuff coming to market with with assumable debt, and then you're you're fit, kind of figuring out the equity piece. But um, but uh, still looking at deals, right? I mean, it's like you, oh you, yeah, you, they're going to yeah. be these perfect conditions. Um, we have some some conversations in our in our office with the acquisitions team, and it's like guys, you know, we're we're bidding on a deal. We're you know like the only group basically kind of making it. You know, if, if rates change dramatically uh, next year, you know, there's going to be 15 groups again in these best and finals and and prices are going to be bonkers. Yep. And so, you know, we're going to have a new set of problems. Maybe, maybe our our debt uh, rate problems will be alleviated, but then now our competition problems are going to go through the roof. So, you know, it's always, always going to yeah. be true. Absolutely. Because that's one thing we were thinking on this last deal we had was that, you know, a lot of institutionals, investors are like pencils down for, yeah. for the quarter. So. Yeah, we were looking at a 50, 50 million dollar deal. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you know, we don't have the competition right now. Right. Like, this isn't being bid up. So yeah. and you totally you know, should. You absolutely should in a normal yeah. more normal market, you would, but yeah, you don't. That's 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 a rare, potentially a rare opportunity. Right, right. Another thing we were trying to we were considering was um, you know, no one wants a full financing contingency in there. Sure. And maybe we're maybe we're back to those times soon, but um, but some sort of indication on like our price offerings versus a 10 year rate. Right. Because you have this 90 well, day risk, right? You're not going to lock absolutely. your loan for 90 days. And yeah. no one wants to just take a loss before you can close. Right. So, right. you know, some sort of upfront discussion, like, Hey, here's a rough curve, you know, here's today is our price. We have no, you know, 10 year treasury increase margin in that price. Yeah. But if it goes up a quarter, this is what we're going to effectively retrade at. And, you know, right. and then uh, begs the question, well, if it goes down a quarter, are we, are you coming up? Will it come up? And I think you probably have to, right. That's kind of, sure. if sure. you're going to have that conversation it has to go both ways. Yeah. Yeah. We lost a deal, big deal. We were selling, uh, had it under contract and they came back with a, a pretty strong retrade, you know, blamed it on the 10 year and, you know, like they had, they had, uh, they had a re- you know a reason uh, ultimately just didn't didn't work for us but um when it moves that quickly and that materially um yeah something's got to give right so, right yeah. so we're thinking like that conversation up front could you know alleviate that rather than right. everyone waste everyone's time and do a retrade you know 30 days out you know it's a lot of time and effort getting all this spun up when we to back away yeah oh absolutely yeah there, there's so many pieces involved and good amount of money involved potentially too on the yeah. On the acquisition side, it's always nice when they close and you go, okay, all right, all that earnest money and pursuit costs and everything else. Oh yeah. Um, we just backed out of a couple of refinances, and I had you know ninety grand with the lender on two deposits, and I'm going, man, I hope I get some of that back. And ended up they just charged me for a couple of third party things that uh, had already been engaged, but got you know ninety percent of that capital back. But right. well, that's good pursuit costs that we that we have on these projects for sure so oh, yeah. yeah yeah that's interesting well what do you see for the future of the firm um is it kind of more the same with the existing setup and team or are you looking at different markets different asset classes or just kind of continue to execute on what's working what's your what's your thought process on that yeah so i've always wanted to get into multiple asset classes yeah. so um in this sort of downtime i'm starting to spin out into industrial yeah. Always like the industrial class. Um, yep. I think there's anything a specific little... there, uh, you know, bay sizes or or certain tenant types or you know, I sort of gravitate towards the the smaller multi-tenant kind of flex industrial just because yeah. it has that like multifamily kind of vibe to it, right? You can there's have eight somewhere. tenants and um, but I'm sort of just digging into to how I want to structure that. But I think probably my first deal will be like a multi-tenant flex industrial yeah. deal. Um, and really one of the reasons is, is obviously Amazon and, you know, more online shopping requires more, more, um, more delivery industrial space. Um, you know, sure. a lot of this onshoring that's happening right now with the EV business and a lot of renewable energy is driving, you know, a lot of manufacturing, which is going to have satellite hubs that are going to yep. need a lot of industrial. Um, there also just doesn't appear to be as much competition. I mean, try to find an industrial podcast, right? Like, no one's sure. talking about it. <laughs> For sure. 
Yeah, that's um, right. It's a different, it's a different deal. We, we started getting into that a couple of years ago. It's been, it's been a neat space. Um, low expense ratios, B2B, right? So, yep. you know, your, your landlord law is a little bit different, at least in Texas. Uh, although Texas is pretty landlord friendly in general, but you know, when you're dealing with a, with a business lease, it, it's just pretty black and white as far as the courts go or, or anything there. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been neat kind of getting into that space and doing something a little bit different. You find out how multifamily is pretty complex. And if you can kind of wrap your head around that and do that well, other asset classes sometimes look uh, like, oh, this looks pretty, pretty straightforward right. compared. Yeah. Less movie to parts. Apartment complex. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. And you'd think it'd be the other way around, but it kind of isn't. Right. Right. Yeah. So oh, that's good. That's good. I think that that makes sense to start looking at other stuff and and ways to deploy capital. Are you guys um, pretty similar in your offerings where it's like, hey, this is a this is a equity offering. Investors own, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 percent of the deal. And, you know, there's a pref or how do you do you structure it differently per deal? What's your approach to that? Yeah, I'd say like, you know, we're pretty standard in the the multifamily market. So typically we have a pref, you know, anywhere between six, six to nine percent, depending on really what you can get out of the deal for cash flow. Yeah. Um, you know, investors typically own, you know, say 60 to 80 percent of the deal, depending on the deal, depending on the size. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have the other the other side of that on the promote. Um, yeah, not nothing too non-standard. You know, we've been trying to we're doing, you know, multiple asset classes. So you can be kind of a high, uh, higher pref, no back end payouts. Let's say like a sure. nine pref yeah, with, with no, no upside. Yep. Um, and then, you know, if you're a high, a big investor, like 500 K plus, you might get a little bit better split and a better pref. Sure. Um, just, just for economies of scale. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then we can bring in those, you know, um, kind of, kind of partners that can raise with us in that capacity. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's good. It's, uh, we found it, we just kind of make things the same on every offering and people kind of get acclimated to it and they know what right. to expect and keep, try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, well, good. Well, Chris has been really enjoyable learning about your business. Um, wish you guys continued success. If somebody listening wants to connect with you, where do we send them? Uh, you can reach me at uh, emcapitalgroup.com, which is my website. And then my email address is Chris Lento. L-E-N-T-O at emcapitalgroup.com. Just send me an email and we can schedule a call. Awesome. Well, if you're listening, you can go to the show notes and click through to the website or send Chris an email. But uh, thanks so much for for your time. Uh, it was great to connect. And uh, like I said, wish you a, a bountiful 2024 here ahead. Thanks a lot. Same to you. It was very enjoyable. All right. See you, Chris. Bye. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.